Welcome to GUI and in web browsers, a weekly call when we share GUI and web browser stuff. And it's uh, 17 of July, I think. And we have an agenda and we have a person that will read the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to the call. Uh, top of the agenda is seamless experience around port 8080 uh, or 5001 being taken. So port 8080 being the gateway port by default for IPFS and port 5001 being the API port by default in IPFS. Um, Lydell, you added this to the agenda. Do you care to, care to unpack it a bit further? Are you sure. adding, you're adding more to the agenda right now. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, pressed the wrong button. Uh, yep, so uh, the story behind this uh, is that uh, we, when IPFS node starts, uh, be that go IPFS or IPFS desktop, uh, it uh, tries to open gateway port, which is 8080, and API port, which is 5001. And the problem is that 8080 is a very popular port. And uh, especially if a person is a developer, there's a very high chance uh, the port is already taken by something else, some HTTP server. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's like a default port for gateway. The problem is uh, that sort of impacts the onboarding of new users. Uh, when a person wants to try IPFS, Right now, it's high probability that person is a developer. That means there's high probability of port 8080 being taken. Uh, and that person installs IPFS, uh, go IPFS or IPFS desktop, they start. And the first experience is, oh, it crashed. And it says, oh, port is taken. And usually the message is very vague. Um, so the idea is uh, we should uh, optimize this golden path. Uh, at least for users of uh, IPFS desktop. I think there's a fair, fair assumption we should not introduce any magic for uh, Go IPFS. However, uh, people who install IPFS desktop, there's an, an expectation that the desktop application will just work and do the right thing. Gosh, gosh, gosh. From a, <laughs> to step back a little bit to what you were just saying in the intro, like <clears throat> roughly speaking, our options today are we are several years into this endeavor and we've been using port 8080 the whole time, which has been a source of frustration for a set of developers who use port 8080 for popular web servers or any other service that happens to have lazily chosen port 8080. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to change our default port now, we would cause a lot of surprise for our existing users versus uh, improving the new user experience for new users by picking a more sensible default port. And then there's a problem of like, we can choose random ports, but then we have lots of code elsewhere that is doing best effort heuristics to be like, I'm gonna check port 5001 for a HTTP API and changing that would relying more heavily on a random port would make that process harder. Is the these are the sort of the trade offs that I'm seeing right now? Yes. So uh, mainly we don't want to change defaults because um, for a bit, most of users the default will work fine. However, if uh, the port is already taken, we should optimize that path because uh, it leads to frustration. Like we should uh, avoid situation when someone tries to use IPFS and the first welcome screen is the port is taken. There might be, there might be a reasonable um, proposal to say like the game of port is well defined. Like we pick one that isn't on the table of uh, is it Iana? I and hey, they like they register ports for popular use cases, and perhaps we should pick a different one and uh, apply and use it and have a migration period. 
that's also a it's more like a midterm solution <laughs> i feel like that's the the boring like this we should probably play play this game properly now yeah that's very true um so that's the question should we uh, either way uh, even if we switch to um uh, to unique port uh, there will be still a situation when someone has uh, already something running there. It will be rare, but still. Uh, so I think my point is we should, uh, for the GUI apps, such as IPFS desktop, it should be seamless for user. And there's a path for checking if the thing that is listening on the port is actually IPFS. Uh, so we don't, have any like technical blockers from figuring uh, adding some simple heuristics to tell uh, if the port is ipfs or not and if it's taken uh, picking another one if it's taken by something else uh, picking something uh, different um, Dietrich. the i i really like the the midterm solution of ultimately changing the port to be something that 98000 other developer tools don't use. But I think one of the frustrations that developers have too is that even if we get there first, it's a port race and then their other tools break. So our, our that's great that we got the port, but then their other workflows, IPFS is a pain for that. So the question that I like to ask around things like this is, if, what if we added 1 million to 5 million new developers who are using IPFS? We still think 8080 is the right thing, or let's say we only added 100,000 IPFS developers, so we still think 8080 is the right. And from that understanding of where growth is going to come from, if we continue winning, then maybe we want to have something that will set us up for long term and play nicely with all the other tools. Um, I understand that's, that's not the short term solution. Uh, sort of, uh, sort of related to that is uh, a concept of uh, familiarity. Uh, right now, we know that like eighty eighty is like gateway range. In in the JS world, it's like ninety ninety. It's a bit better, uh, and the API port is on a separate namespace, which is like five thousand something. Uh, so at least there's like a visual indicator which is which. And I think I finally can show you what I wanted to show you before. Um, so the thing is that uh, right now I have a Go IPFS uh, running on 5001. Uh, and if I switch to embedded node, by default, it will listen on 5003. But I can like hard code it to try to use the same port uh, Go IPFS did. Uh, which is 5001. And what uh, happened before behind the scenes, uh, uh, companion detected that the port is already taken and it just picked the next one from the same range. Uh, this is uh, how we want uh, the experience of browser extension to work. Uh, there should be no like errors, uh, it should just automatically pick uh, the free port. Um, so, yeah, Oli. Um, I'm generally down with picking a random port in the meantime, uh, where we find the default port is unavailable. I think my thinking was coming from, as a web app, there's no good way for me to discover a local IPFS API running on the system. Yep. And as it stands, our recommended path for that is to use a companion. Window.ipfs has caveats, but the the path of like have a random web app have direct access to your API is still pretty ropey. It's it's a terrible security model. It's a terrible UX model. Uh, so I'm kind of okay with like pick random ports. I think if you install desktop today and the options are like crash, 
or install successfully, but you are now running things on different ports. I think we probably need to go for running things on random ports, not crash, but we need to highlight to the user that your setup is not the same as everyone else's. So certain, certain things might not work as expected. Like you will have to go and configure companion. Whereas another user won't have to configure companion, they'll just drop it in and it'll work out of the box. I guess it's, the best we can do right now is be robust and signpost people to the ramifications of that difference. Does that make sense? Like, like right now, companion and desktop, in, if you're not running on ATA, people just work out the box. And that's great. And if desktop puts things on random ports, there's no way for companion to know that. Yeah, so it's like, um, it's a topic of local discovery in general. Mm. It's like very generic problem of IPFS nodes uh, or tools that want to use IPFS nodes discovering where the node is. Yeah, so there, there are tools. Like if you're writing a tool that has access to system APIs, like we could discover things on MDNS, but alas, companion is not one of those. And that's, I guess, the thing that we care about most at this point is like, from a GUI, IPFS GUI perspective is like, desktop works out the box, companion works out the box, and you have a good experience. When you read the documentation, the things that it tells you to run work for you. So I imagine there are places all over the documentation where we're like, try localhost 8080 to get to your gateway. And it's like, well, if we picked a random port, that documentation is now broken for your perspective. Mm -hmm. For like for companion, companion is sort of like an easy, easy case because we control both IPFS companion and IPFS desktop. So we can figure it out a protocol where like desktop opens a page and companion takes that as a hint. Right. However, we should think about like third party developers. Yeah, who totally. Don't have that privilege. Um, and that's like sort of, I think it's rather than a specific to API port like specific to ports, it's more about uh, local discovery and the problem of having multiple nodes uh, on single machine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like at some abstraction level, it collapses into a single problem. Uh, if you have like multiple nodes or if you have multiple tools that wants to talk to a single node, it's just a matter of the local discovery not being there. You're saying if you, if you stand on a tool building, everyone looks like ants? Yes. <laughs> okay. <Gotcha>. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, I, yes, although I'd be wary of that level of abstraction can make it hard to fix anything. Um, mm. Yeah, there is the the ongoing discussion of like, what does a a cluster of, of discovered local nodes on one machine look like? Like, how would that process function? That would be super cool. I feel like there are smaller battles to fight mm. between here and there. I think I think the problem resides in like web pages and web extensions talking to a daemon that has assigned itself random ports. I think I think there is a path for local tooling to discover if we can. We, I I need to double check with the MDNS story, but the theory goes like if I'm running a tool that has act, like direct access to its own. IPFS binaries or direct access to the system where it can do MDNS queries, then it can discover a local API that is on a non-standard port. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and uh, yeah, so it would be useful to have Hugo because uh, I'm pretty sure he uh, sort of solved that for uh, for IPNS in web browser prototype, and and the idea was to uh, announce uh, like. DNS using DNS uh, discovery service to announce like IPFS IPNS local web service and that service like acts as a bridge everyone talks to that service uh, as a rendezvous point and you are always uh, sort of you, you you know that if that service is there you will get the uh, IPFS node I just realized that Dietrich isn't flamboyantly saying hello. He's referring to the Bonjour protocol. Yeah, that thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's basically we, the same thing. Yeah. What, 
what would you say our actions are for this topic? Uh, I, I'd say the first thing is to figure it out uh, ports and registering them as our ports. And if we have uh, like get 80, 80. yeah, like the if we have this new canonical port, we can like make our tools to check both old default port and new default port, and that would like solve most of edge cases. Um, and then. I think we've already sort of uh, discussed this with Henrik uh, about like making IPFS desktop more gentle on users when port is taken, uh, like figuring out uh, if the thing that is listening on a port is IPFS or not, and then uh, telling user that uh, the port, the default port is taken, and do you and do you want to start IPFS on a different port or do you want to quit and figure it out on your own? I think that's like the safe default uh, that would both uh, make uh, less technical and more technical users happy. Uh, we had a related request the other day on the issue tracker for uh, let me so I've started using desktop and I've realized that I'm using IPFS a lot. It's taking up a lot of storage space on my main drive. Can I rehome it? Can desktop be like, move my IPFS home to this external drive? The actual request was like, ask me up front where I want to store things. And so then there's, there's two possible solutions. It's like have a kind of, we, we had this in desktop previous version that there was a step during install that, that asked you a bunch of questions. And to streamline things, we removed it. But that's <laughs> for simplicity, we have traded off some uh, user understanding, or certainly, uh, I would quite like it if it was easy to get started, didn't ask me these questions, and then uh, allow desktop to, re to move an IPFS home directory. That would be pretty good. I think like it's sort of supported right now. You just set uh, IPFS home or IPFS path variable. So there's the UX is missing, right? <laughs> uh, uh, what I'm saying is you start as a new user, you start using IPFS desktop and it puts a bunch of uh, okay. block, blocks into a block store in your home directory. And to have a button in desktop that's like, I would like to move this, not like I want to forget my old identity and create a new one. With nothing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, that would be maybe not tricky. It would like re require a re restart of Go IPFS, but like desktop is on top of that, so sh should be possible. Yeah. It's possible. Cool. Uh, whew, Twenty-four minutes, and that's one one item off the agenda. Shall we tick? Yep. All right. Uh, next up is how to handle subdomain gateway on localhost. Uh, th this one is sort of long, so I'll try to be very brief. <laughs> What's a subdomain gateway? Yeah, so subdomain gateway is when you put a uh, content ID in uh, the subdomain instead of uh, the path of your URL. Uh, I can, uh, I think I can like uh, show quickly maybe faster. Uh, so this is uh, Wikipedia loaded from subdomain gateway provided by Cloudflare. Uh, there's a content identifier in the very beginning. It's a CID v1 in base32. And there's a, uh, there's a short uh, domain name which has like the name of namespace and the, there's like a actual domain and there's a path under that CID. So the way this works, uh, you can use any uh, gateway with the same uh, subdomain here. Um, so the CID is in the, is in the subdomain, not the path. Yeah, that's a short story. And uh, the thing is like, it's easy to reason about uh, when we have an actual domain, uh, what happens on local machine when you've installed IPFS, you run local gateway. Um, it's possible to have uh, subdomains under localhost hostname. Uh, however, 
we don't want to have both uh, subdomain based and path based gateways on the same host name. I feel we should pause there. Uh, it was news to me that you could have subdomains on localhost. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think because with the, the user experience that you're trying to get to is like we want to move the ecosystem towards putting the subdomain, putting the CID in the subdomain because mm -hmm. That gets us browse the browser's normal origin sandbox then makes sense again. Whereas CIDs in the path means that everybody's content in a co-hosted environment, everybody's context is everybody's content is in the same sandbox. So has influence over the root domain, bad times. Now and if we can move the ecosystem, the IPFS ecosystem towards putting the CID in the subdomain. Hooray, we're playing nicely with browser-based origin sandbox again. But do we also have this problem of we want links to be able to be resolved to your local, uh, your local IPFS gateway if you're running one, and also have sensible fallbacks to be able to get a remote HTTP gateway if you're not running a local one? It's a challenge. It's a challenge and uh, there's a lot of quirky stuff around localhost and the way web browsers uh, handle that. Um, the main problem is we only have one host name for like actual host name is localhost. So if we want to use subdomains, uh, we need to, to use that and we cannot use localhost for path based uh, gateway. So this is because you don't want to host the subdomain version, CIDs in the subdomain and CIDs in the path on the same gateway? Yeah, on, the se yeah, on, the same, uh, on the same domain. Yeah, so the, or, uh, on the same origin, right? Origin is like hostname plus port, uh, the plus protocol. Um, it's interesting to unpack that a little bit. Like your feeling is it's a security hazard to sort of say, here's the secure way of getting content from this gateway. And if we were to also support path-based CIDs, then we'd be saying, but it's also the insecure way. It's like, I would not say secure and insecure. It's just a matter of when you want origin isolate, like when you want to isolate stuff and to, when you don't care about that type of isolation. So if you load websites from IPFS, you care about uh, origin-based isolation because websites then can use local storage, cookies, and they cannot uh, edit each other's uh, cookies, uh, storage, and stuff. Uh, the thing is that on the local host, uh, when we run uh, the gateway, we, we don't want to expose both on the same name because the gateway, which is using paths, will have access to all the cookies of all subdomains. Uh, that's how like isolation works because the path will be on the root domain and that root domains have access to everything. That is why for localhost, uh, the only thing I sort of uh, see as a path to move forward is to detect request, like the, our gateway should detect request to localhost name without any subdomain and then redirect that to just IP. And that's sort of a trick because the IP is interpreted as a different host name. And that way the origin uh, sandbox created by web browser will be separate. And then we, have, we can have both subdomain based gateway and path based gateway on a local host machine. Is, uh, it, is it fair to say that path-based gateways that we have today would essentially be legacy. Like this, there isn't a good reason to use it. We would want to migrate people to subdomain-based gateways because they're just, they're, they just have this security flaw that we can't work around. Yeah, it's like- uh, Barring pushing forward work on sub-origin specification. Yeah. Which is, a, which is a good protocol labs, boil the ocean kind of, strategy 
Yeah, so it's like uh, the matter of uh, what are you using IPFS for? Uh, generally, the subdomain based gateway can be used for everything and, and solves those problems that we had with the path based one. But I believe a lot of people will still want to continue using that mostly because they don't want to change all the setups they have. Uh, they often put IPFS behind Nginx uh, and then use the path based addressing. Um, on our gateway, like the main gateway, the IPFS IO, I believe we will want to at some point just redirect everyone to the subdomain based one at the DNS link. Um, but for this transitional period, and also as an option for people who care about just having path addressing uh, without any manipulation, we still need to support uh, the path ones. And uh, there's like a discussion uh, between me and Stephen on the PR on Go IPFS repo when we want to add support for like native support for subdomain gateways to Go IPFS. Right now, if people want to run their uh, subdomain gateway, they need to add some additional code in, at the Nginx level, which sits in, in front of uh, Go IPFS. What we want to do is to make super simple for people to host their own uh, gateways with subdomain support. So you just run Go IPFS if you choose to do so without any uh, Nginx in front of it, and it should just work. Uh, but I, it's not like we will deprecate uh, path gateways, if that's the question. <laughs> Sorry, it's literally what I just wrote in the notes. But um, Dietrich. Uh, so my understanding was that the end goal was to deprecate path-based addressing because of. I guess I guess deprecate is is a strong word in this case because permanent web and links and link rot. But if if there are no drawbacks to releasing new versions of Go IPFS that redirect slash uh, IPFS slash CID to a subdomain, that starts to, to solve the problem over time until eventually everyone's running that. A, spe a specific, I guess, would we ever do that in, on IPFS.io? Could you foresee a time when we upgrade the gateways for IPFS.io? such that they redirect requests where the CID is in the path to have the CID in the subdomain? Uh, I don't believe we will support subdomain gateway at the IPFS IO domain. That we have like, we, we want to leave this domain just for the project. That's like sort of a uh, uh, separate, separate topic. Uh, but well, uh, I'm, well I'm, I, I always think of IPFS.io as like part of the upgrade path for the web kind of it's the it's the address you can share today that has graceful fallback oh i mean like uh, the way it will work uh, if you share the old school ipfs io slash ipfs something that will redirect that will redirect to the web link mm -hmm. but we are uh, we could support like subdomains on IPFS IO, but those would redirect to the web link. We, we want, that's a separate problem. We just want to move away from IPFS IO. The problem is if we share the same domain uh, of, the, like, of the project itself with the gate, default gateway, then uh, or if uh, some content uh, is uh, shared through the gateway, uh, the takedown notices or like DNS blocks for the gateway impact our project page, which is not good. Uh, Dietrich and Hugo, questions? Uh, I guess I, I wanted to share my concern that anywhere that we allow path-based addressing to remain permanently for new content is a place where people who want to do things like session hijacking and, and exploits is just a big, open, well-known open door, the welcome mat. So I guess that's why, in, in as much as I understand the compatibility concerns, uh, and I'm glad there are so many options for handling that, I really do feel it's important that the understood goal is to not support path-based addressing, as long as there is no way to mitigate the security issue. Oh, totally, like, totally. And the plan we will eventually hit like Hacker News level slammed for this. 
Yeah, and uh, actually we sort of already started planning uh, around that and the idea is that it will be like a switch that you are not able to have both on non-local host IP. You, you are not able to have both subdomain and path address to gateway. And if you make a request, like path address request, uh, it will be re redirected. That will be like HTTP 301 to the subdomain. So that way links will not be broken, uh, but you won't be able to abuse that. Any question, Hugo? Is that something that we want to add to our HTTP servers or leave to the user's Nginx setup? Uh, the end goal is to have that logic uh, in our Go IPFS and JS IPFS gateways. Um, so the, just like Dietrich said, the surface for misconfiguration should be like removed. And that by, that by default, we should default to the subdomains. And uh, that, that will be like the tyranny of the default, right? Yeah, there's definitely like different user stories here where we, we're talking a lot about the one where another user wants to stand up a public multi-tenant IPFS gateway. But what, what tends to keep surfacing is that most people want to run an app or community or single use case specific gateway and also better tooling around. I just want to, I don't want people to be able to request any CID through my HTTP gateway. I want to be able to present a bunch of blocks that are predefined, like have a whitelist um, of CIDs that my gateway will provide. I think that's a whole other side of this that is sort of just trying to like keep every single thing as it was is probably not as important as figuring out what the major use cases are. Um, but it sounds like redirecting path CIDs to uh, subdomain CIDs is a huge win. And we should just, that should be a feature that we roll out as soon as we can. And big, uh, big gold star for Lidl's multi month, multi year effort to get base 32 CIDs. V1 CIDs. Heroes, heroes one and all. Uh, should we put a pin on that? Got 20 minutes left. Any other thoughts? Um, I just have a quick thing to share. Um, yeah. Just a quick plug uh, about migration to CADV1. Uh, there's uh, an issue in IPFS, IPFS, and in the very first uh, comment created by Kyle. There's a link to a big bird's eye view, which I sort of went over recently and updated a little bit. So you can see uh, all the PRs and issues related to the effort. Uh, there's, of course, I think more than that. However, uh, it's a good entry point if you want to see where we are. I yeah. tried. Had a link to that in the notes. Yep, I tried to update it uh, once a while. So it may fall a little bit behind uh, ongoing work, but generally it's a good place to start. Um, Okay, anything else on that? Otherwise, right. we're going to mention quickly uh, removing special cases and hacks around web UI. So, Go IPFS team is talking about releasing more, more regularly, faster release cycle. Um, but at the minute, that is blocked on a longer release cycle while we get our testing story. Uh, to be more robust, but I think the general direction of momentum there is to release with more a more predictable frequency uh, In the meantime in the many months leading up to that Rydal and I have slowly been Adding hacks to places and rolling out newer versions of the web UI in In ways in the ways we could so this is 
Uh, the most obvious one is the open web UI button in companion will open a CID, a version of web UI that it, it's, it's going it, to, it bundles with companion. It used to bundle it. Now it just redirects to the latest CID, but it has to do some tricks to make that work. So in go IPFS, there is just a list of blessed CIDs that can be loaded that can be loaded via the api port which means they have uh, unrestricted access to the api and that list of cids is all the released versions of web ui no other web app gets that blessing um, but this makes it means that we can only release new versions of web ui by pr and go ipfs and waiting for their next release uh, so in the meantime, Lytle came up with the trick that was like, because the API auth is just, just relies on cores. If you don't send the origin header, <laughs> as companion has the power to do, just remove origin headers, then uh, companion can allow blessed newer CIDs, so it can allow new releases of web UI. And we did this for a good reason. It, like There was a long gap in IPFS releases and we discovered some pretty critical bugs in web UI and needed to get the fixes out but we are now seeing that that is causing other issues oh, so the proposal is to remove this workaround so have companion simplify things so that it doesn't have its own internal blessed list of CIDs it just defers to uh, port 5001 slash web UI and that will get you the version of web UI that go IPFS ships with even if that's a bit old um, and then as an extension to that idea to get back to this feeling of most people should use the stable version but some people may want to use the, a more bleeding edge version of web UI to include in go IPFS's blessed list of addresses uh, an IPNS address for IPNS slash web UI dot IPFS dot IO and then have a toggle in companion that lets you say i would like to when i say open web ui from the companion drop down i would like to use the stable version which is whatever your go ipfs or jsipfs says uh, but if you flip to give me the bleeding edge then it will open up the ipns link to webui.ipfs.io question from hugo um uh, about that to basically um, don't actually ship web UI inside desktop. Uh, yeah, th so desktop is a separate separate concern, but yeah. We had a couple of conversations already to um, a good way that we can like upgrade web apps to use the local daemon would be to find a way to connect the browser and the local daemon. The local daemon being the, the desktop, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways would be something like that. Instead of like shipping with where you buy inside the desktop, you basically would open um, where you buy in the browser. And when you basically, uh, ask uh, ask the browser to load the web UI. You kind of you have a, a way to send uh, some information. Then you can kind of sync the configuration instead of relying on um, predefined ports and IPs and stuff like that. Just just a thought that we uh, has been discussed a couple of times. Um. So right now, desktop bundles a release of web ui essentially just for first first usage performance like if you open the desktop app and then you're like please wait while i go and fetch the web ui from ipfs um there's i mean there's the ongoing question of like desktop could actually just be the drop down menu and have it when you click files it just opens a browser uh, and then you could have a query string param that tells you what API port to use. Um, yeah, I think right now that that pile of logic and bundling isn't causing us any problems. 
So what we're what we're seeing today is the uh, companion having its own list of blessed CIDs is running afoul of it'll load a version of web UI that GoIPFS hasn't blessed and it strips the origin headers and that then I'm not sure what I can't remember the exact like joining of the dots but we saw it, it was the problem I saw today was I'd added some cause config to my go IPFS and then I did a fresh install of companion and open web UI couldn't connect to my desktop daemon because the act of adding cause config to go IPFS also triggers some latent additional additional baiting in checks that maybe Rydal can speak to. Oh yeah, it's just uh, as I said. The additional context is that apart from regular cores that everyone knows uh, on, is, is happening on the web, uh, Go IPFS has some additional hardening when you request from the different origin that the local host, uh, different origin than uh, the API port on local host. So it's like hardened cores which even if we tr trick, uh, use this trick of removal or origin header, still the go code uh, that is on the Go IPFS side uh, will return a forbidden error, HTTP error. Um, it's a very low level. The, the gist is that Go IPFS goes extra mile on top of course. Uh, and it's just a losing battle to uh, try to work around and build additional layers and keep diff like multiple lists of blessed web UI when we can just agree that now that Go IPFS will have regular releases and web UI release cycle slowed down and we are sort of like stable right now, it should be fine to just delegate web UI loading to Go IPFS. You are muted, Lolly. Any questions on that one? Hmm, good. Uh, next up, uh, what have we got? Surfacing Proto School on IPFS and JS IPFS. Proto School is like part of this IPFS docs task force this quarter. And one of the things I'm working on is making sure that anywhere we're teaching about uh, IPFS in docs, whether that's website or GitHub, API documentation, whatever, and there is relevant protocol context content that we're linking to it. So I've put in a bunch of issues, some a bunch of them, Alan has been kind enough to merge for me already, um, in GitHub spots, but I wanted to just run by people some ideas for how we would surface it better on the actual websites. Um, and I'm very open to suggestions here. So uh, on the main IPFS website, one spot I see that might work naturally is here where we're offering options for deeper look at IPFS. Maybe there's a second button that's uh, explore proto school tutorials. I think of, I mean, I don't think I'm going to pull any traffic from the white paper because I think of these as different audiences who care about these things, but that's one thought just with the way things are set up right now. It's not, Proto School is not really an implementation or an app. Uh, the footer seems super crowded. I don't know if people have other, if they like that button think, idea. If yeah, like I think um, beefing up that section at the bottom of the footer to be like, okay, you if you like white papers, here it is. If you want documentation, go here. If you want tutorials, go to Proto School. Like that seems like a good. Did you mean it, to say Twitter, or did you mean this? No. Yeah, the beef button. up that beef up that section. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Definitely not the footer. Okay. Shall I just add the to the Proto School button, or was there something else you were suggesting to have? I kind I kind of like the like. If you're very technical, you'll like this white paper. If you're regular dev, you might like the docs. If you like tutorials, proto school. 
like the three three kind of okay. offerings seems good all right any other ideas on standard ipfs.io so js ipfs.io i do it's not accepted yet but i put in a pr so that when you go when if you click tutorials proto school tutorials will be listed alongside the ones that just kind of live in a repo that you have to download and explain that you're not going to have to download them um my other thought was this getting started where it says try it out below could say try it out below or check out our tutorials on proto school with just a linked text uh i don't know that we have other kind of natural spots already just people have ideas the um those tutorials uh seems to bottom out in a uh find out more button so about there i'd be like probably replace that with a big call out to proto school okay oh yeah this is going to the the tutorials again the yeah. same place on github where i'm adding something else do you think we should be replacing it or just offering two options yeah that's a pretty dead bit of the page it seems like it would survive a hey you should also know about pro school it'd be nice if pro school had some like specific well it's all jsf i guess but uh that learn button seems a bit dead on its own on that page and if that section was slightly more rich and was like you probably want proto school okay uh, and then again right. at the bottom i think there was another section uh like here just up a bit up a bit up a bit like what can you build and then below that it's like oh go try out some of these pro cool things yeah okay. right anyone else this is uh is this hugo the what's the thing called is this built off of one of those weird Get, things? i think it's gatsby yeah uh, oh is it yeah this one yeah. is uh is yeah. something else yeah it's a gatsby all right i shall attempt and ask for help if I can't figure out where stuff happens. This, but uh, I link to that issue in the notes. So if people have other ideas, let me know. And you may see more random PRs coming in and various IPFS repos as I try to update documentation. So feel free to use your powers to approve my suggestion. There is one more item on the agenda. We need a K. Oh, we need a key result around desktop, uh, GUI, and key three. E.g., we keep shipping it, fixing highest priority stuff, but not low priority stuff. Currently written as desktop and web UI are stable and usable. Uh, E.g., we're not regressing them as we ship new stuff this quarter. Um, and, so, and sort of, I would add on top of like uh, keep, keeping shipping it, uh, like. Things that like the discussion about remove, removal of web UI, all the overhead, uh, all the hacks and unnecessary optimizations. So like part of maintaining it and uh, would be removal of, of stuff that's over complicated. Wow. I would like to frame right. it somehow in the key R. Uh, uh, who added this to the agenda? That would be me. Like reducing complexity of our GUI apps and things like that. Or like maintenance burden, decreasing um, maintenance burden. I think that's what we want to do with web UI, for example. I, I would encourage you to add the wording that you would like to that KR. This, this group is in control of your destiny with regards to how we continue working on and shipping these things. But the, which, which team is looking after it? Right now is the uh, make sure that they're still shipping and not regressing just has my name on it next in the project operations. Right on. So I would love your assistance. 
in writing the KR that meets your needs best in this area. Okay. Um, well, so this uh, this discussion is largely around we've moved focus to things like making sure we do a good job of uh, the package manager's endeavor. So fixing the perf issues and adding the features we need to support package managers and do a good job of running the IPFS.io gateway and empowering others to run high, reliable gateways for others. Um, so that has bumped down the amount of time and energy that we will have to work on desktop and WI over the next three to six months. Um, but we haven't checked in with Enrique about what he would like to focus on over the next three to six months. So it may be that Enrique can keep focusing on desktop, but that is a conversation for perhaps not now, but it's worth noting that, that there might still be an Enrique to focus on it. Uh, do, do you want me to check in with that KR? Was that directed at me or the, the group? No, the, I, I, I'm, I don't really know who you are, but uh, I'm getting to know you a little better and I know you come here regularly. I'm uh, often here. <laughs> <laughs> this is really to the whole group, right? Like, I mean, this is uh, after that, that we, you know, we need to focus on, on, on docs and performance and stability, making sure our services are up. Um, and, but we, everybody acknowledges that there are dependencies still on things like, like web UI and desktop networking. And there are really strong dependencies on, on, on the networking and not, not regressing and making sure that it's still functional um, from the brave work that I was doing too. So uh, it's not that there is it's one of those situations where we need to make sure that it continues to work as well as it does these yep. things. But the benefit of less overhead means we get to do things like you know, features. So what Lytle said, I think, is great to capture in that in that KR. It's also important to note that uh, both Enrique and Justin are working on cool new features for uh, the BI. Um, so it's worth us. It's worth making sure that we have. Like if there are things that we do want to achieve over the next three to six months, that we are clear about what is in, what's on our flight path. And then also to wonderful community members like Justin be like, oh yeah, don't worry. We're not going to like trample all over the work you're doing. If that's stuff that you are interested in, like that's plenty of room for that. Yeah, that um, that's exactly why I want to capture. It's not, you know, that um, they're using the word maintenance and stuff like that. And like, that's not really the correct characterization because yeah. not only do we have contributions continuing, we also have uh, real ship dependencies that we have on web UI to be able to ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. The one piece of work that does need to be done is to go through the backlog of issues on web UI and desktop and just give them like a, a triage in the sense of, if we can say like that's a high priority, but we're you know there's help wanted, um, or this one doesn't make any sense, close it out, uh, and this one is stuff that we're still planning to do in the next three months, so that we can reduce how many, uh, how much time we spend that we throw at it, but we can at least leave it in a state where interested parties can see what is what would be really useful to work on if they've got free time, and versus like what are known issues that aren't going to get fixed anytime soon. We're at the hour mark. Does anyone have any, any burning think desires that they want to talk about? Any hopes, any dreams? All the time. All the time. Um, it, Justin, if you want to talk at all about the Identicon stuff, I can, I can stay on the line for a minute. Sure. Um, did you want to talk about that right now? We can basically, I resubmit that PR. We're going to add identicons to the peer table. So when you have a CID for a peer right next to it, you'll see a little identicon that's unique to every peer ID. So it makes it easier to identify peers that are being used as relays and things like that. It's super cool. Um, thank you for rebasing that. I will take a look tomorrow. Um, Sounds good. Enrique, your piece of work is so large and wild that maybe we should devote a little bit of time to it next week. 
Like it'd be nice to put that on the agenda for next week's call. But it's okay. the, the the headline, the teaser for Enrique's demo next week is um, in the current format, Web UI is focused around visualizing the files that are in your MFS, your mutable file system view of your IPFS repo, which is just a tiny sliver of what can possibly be in there. Anything that you IPFS add doesn't show up. Your pins don't necessarily show up unless they happen to also be in there. Enrique has taken this idea and run with it. So rethinking the file browser so that it can not only show like arbitrary IPFS addresses. So today, if you paste an IPFS address into the explore bar at the top, it opens in the IPLD explorer and shows you the underlying data model, which is fun, but way too low level as a starting point. Like if I have an IPFS address, chances are I want to see the content at the IPFS address. So he's, he's done a large PR that like changes the focus to be more, to be more flexible so that you can load arbitrary content. You can visualize your pins list. Uh, it's going to be round. And it's so close. Uh, tune in next week for the great web UI ending. And that is all she wrote. If there is any more business, you have one last second to interject. Otherwise, that's goodbye from me and goodbye from all of you. This has been the IPFS in web browsers and GUI team weekly call. See you next week. Bye. Bye.